I just say that I sent you a mail that uh, Puerto La Cruz is not the warmest nor the sunniest part of, <laughs> of Tenerife. Uh, but we hope that we will have uh, some better time in the, future, in the next days. Uh, and let me start thanking Marco because he's the father of the idea. Uh, so the, he's uh, why we are all here. Uh, thank you, Marco, uh, for that. <clears throat> Well, uh, so I, I will briefly give you some important information, and the most important is how to connect to internet, right? Just connect to the Wi-Fi by Mar, and and it will open a uh, in, in in the navigator will open uh, a page asking for a new user and a password that is there. Sometimes it has it has some permissions problem. I, I tried with three different uh, navigators until I could be able to, uh, to, in, to enter. I couldn't with Firefox, I couldn't with the uh, Windows one, but with Chrome. And I, I, I don't know how to change these permissions. Nobody knows, right? Work it for it. So it's, it's, it's a bit of the computer. <laughs> uh, 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 coffee breaks are going to be up outside in the terrace outside some wonderful place we will have the coffee breaks so using the stairs or the elevator we can go there the lunch is going to be in the same restaurant we, we have breakfast here in the first floor and the, and the companion persons are included so we can have a, a lunch all together that the idea is that we continue our interest in these debates and discussions during lunch and, uh, and uh, the conference will be also in the third floor, but in the, in the restaurant that it is just close by the, the one we use for breakfast. Okay, please, uh, please let us know as soon as possible your preference. Uh, if you want the, the pork, or if you want the fish, or you want vegetarian, we have because we have tell have to tell the hotel to prepare this. And also, if you have any problem allergies, or you you eat without salt or whatever. Uh, uh, the speakers can use uh, their own computers or can use mine, but mine is Mac, and sometimes, you know, between Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac, uh, PowerPoint makes a strange thing. So if you plan to use mine, my advice is to bring a PDF, a PDF top. And we will try something strange uh, the, to broadcast the... Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the conference, conference in our YouTube channel. We have a, we, we, we made a YouTube channel, so we will broadcast uh, using uh, uh, Google Hangouts, uh, public Hangouts. Uh, to do not disturb the speaker, we ask you to, to give us the, the, the talk in a PDF. So, uh, Mario and David, the, the back, will use these PDFs to broadcast and they change the slides while you change the slides here and mark uh, with, the, with the mouse what you are pointing with the pointer and so on. So uh, uh, I know there are, many, there are better ways of doing that. I know, but uh, you need some hardware, you need some preparation. And this is uh, something that we did at the very last moment. And, uh, but it works. So if you don't agree to be, to be broadcaster, which we will not do, of course. And uh, we, were, we had to sign up a, a permission. In this epoch, you have, you have to sign permission for everything. The, our institute say that they need to have this, otherwise you can't. Okay, so uh, that is all, all I have to say. Uh, I hope we have a very interesting and uh, very productive meeting. Thank you again for being here. And uh, I'll ask Marco to say some words for you. Um, Okay, thank you, Javier. Thank you, Javier, for organizing this. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here. I've seen many, uh, let's say, known faces, some faces that I don't know. So this is great. Um, so we divided the program in basically three uh, days. The first day is mostly devoted to asteroids, and the second day is mostly devoted to icy bodies, comets, and um, transitional objects, and so far, the third day is uh, um, devoted to the moon. Um, we have a uh, Paul Hein, Heine, if I pronounce right, uh, that he has a challenge to give uh, two talks because uh, Rebecca Ghent could not make it. 
for personal uh, um, issues, nothing serious. And uh, we have uh, also laboratory work um, that is mostly the Oxford group and others. Uh, Jorgen uh, is here and so on uh, to support uh, astronomical observations. Um, the final part is about future perspectives. Uh, Paolo, Paolo Tanga will also give a little uh, uh, overview about Gaia, which is a European space mission that is uh, devoted to um, get uh, about one or probably two billion stars for astrometry and precise photometry, but also observe many uh, objects in the solar system. So we'll hear about this. Um, Paolo is also the inventor of the name Thermops, which stands for Thermal Models for Planetary Science. The first meeting uh, happened in 2008 in near Nice. I think uh, that's it. Uh, from my side, we can start. Yes, and you start. Okay. <laughs> so, the uh, first speaker and is, uh, is Marco Delbo. And I don't have to talk here. <laughs> so, no, you, you can introduce your speech. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, Marco? Okay, te la dejo. Okay. Okay, so th uh, thank you. So the first talk is uh, basically, um, uh, actually, uh, the title was uh, uh, suggested by Alan Harris, DLR, and he uh, actually, we asked him to give this talk, but he could not come because of conflicting uh, meeting uh, of his uh, European Near Shield, and so he could not uh, make it. So uh, he told me to give this talk. Um, and uh, I'll, this is a general uh, historical perspective and development of thermal models, simple thermal models and thermophysical models. <clears throat> and is, uh, of, of course, biased towards asteroids because I'm mostly working on asteroids. So I apologize for this. Um, okay. So... Basically, uh, we are here, so uh, uh, thermal modeling and thermophysical modeling is all about calculating temperature of the surface and the subsurface of uh, um, airless bodies in the solar system. Um, these, um, so the process we take into account is basically the illumination from the sun, the heat diffusion, the mutual heating between uh, uh, facets of different uh, parts of the shape model uh, due to the uh, scattering of uh, reflected photons and thermal photons and other processes. Um, so the, uh, the parameters that we deal with are basically the albedo, the thermal conductivity, heat capacity, massivity, density, roughness, so, uh, along with the shape, uh, so the elevation, the topography of the model, its orientation in space, and its previous thermal history that are taken into account. Of course, the distance from the sun has a major effect. So if the object is close to the sun, it's very hot, it's, it's far, it's cold. Um, we basically divide this uh, approach into two classes of models. The simple thermal models, simple or just thermal models, that uh, assume usually spherical shapes and simplify the calculation of temperatures. So basically they don't deal uh, uh, with the heat conduction or they have a simplified models for the heat conduction. And then we have thermophysical models that have uh, all this complexity that I described added uh, to, the, to the problem. And here I just show an example. So the sphere that could be the near, uh, near Earth thermal model and below the uh, uh, temperature wrapped on the uh, Model 2 of the Churim of Gerasimenko, uh, the uh, Victor gave it. If one, one, just a little bit of school thing, thing. so if uh, basically uh, the, it's, it's very easy to calculate temperature in the first place at zero order and can be very complex if you want to go to very uh, high details. So the instantaneous thermal equilibrium is the equation number two that tells you that the uh, absorbed radiation must be equal to the emitted radiation by a facet. 
And if you put numbers to those constants, so one minus the albedo, the solar constants, this is 1.3 uh, kilowatt per meter square divided by the heliocentric distance, and you equate it to the temperature of the facet, you get the temperature. It's very easy. And if you put the numbers, you get a 1 AU is about 400 K. Fine. And then the temperature scales with the square root of the heliocentric distance. Uh, so it's, it's the inverse of square root of the heliocentric distance. So it's very easy. Uh, of course, the thermal emission peak is given by this formula, the Wien law. And so if you put 400, you get 7.5 microns. If it's 300, it's 10 microns. So that's the peak of your emission. And in one just single line of GNU plot, you can get this temperature as function of the centric distance given by the formula here. So very, very easy. And it works because you get, for example, from the main belt temperature around 250 and uh, uh, object that goes very close to the sun, like the poor uh, 300, uh, 3200 uh, Phaeton asteroids uh, uh, that Javier, Julia, and so on studied very well gets to much higher temperature, about 1,000 uh, K. Whereas icy bodies in the outer solar system are much, much cooler. So why we do this? There are many, many reasons for these calculating temperatures. And um, so, for example, because if you know the temperature, you can calculate the thermal uh, flux and that you can measure with telescopes and detector, infrared detector at these telescopes. and, and and the flux is, uh, the thermal flux is uh, directly related to the size of the asteroid. We'll see in a second. So you measure, we measure sizes this way. But of course, it's very important for also if you want to land on an asteroid, if you want to sample an asteroid. And we had this experience with uh, OSIRIS-REx, NASA OSIRIS-REx, that is going to uh, sample uh, the asteroid Bennu. And uh, they want to know, the engineer want to know the temperature environment the temperature where you sample. And um, it's real. So I remember for a little story when I gave my talk, my job interview at the CNRS in France, I said, well, one day we will do this. And then that day came. And uh, <laughs> when I got uh, involved in the Iron and the engineer told me, I calculated temperature, and the engineer told me, oh, this is too hot. We cannot do this. And so it's, it's scary because you've got to be careful with this thing. And so there is a group, uh, uh, Ben uh, Rosaitis and uh, uh, Josh Emery and I, uh, mostly uh, Josh and, and Ben, are now working for uh, this thing for Rosaitis Rex and many others because you need to know the thermal environment for sizing the radiators of the instruments and so on. It's also important for the determination of the material properties of uh, asteroids and comets and so on. And in, in a certain way, by doing these studies, we go, we went from, in the last 10 years, from like looking at asteroids, like tiny dots in the solar system to object with complex ge ge geology and geophysics. So from thermal inertia and thermal conductivity, we can say whether there's regolith or not and so on. We'll see this. This is the work that uh, beautifully done by Jürgen and his former student, uh, Bastian Gundler and others. Um, the temperature can also change the mineralogy. If you're a phaeton and you go too very close to the sun, probably your thermal crack or some, some, uh, some parts of the surface can burn. And also the temperature environment is super important for the Yarkovsky effect that I think you all know what it is. But uh, in the Yarkovsky effect, uh, by measuring the Yarkovsky effect and knowing the thermal properties and the physical properties of the asteroids, you can basically weight asteroids. You can get the density, the bulk density of asteroids, which is very, very good. Um, for, for your interest, there are three uh, chapters in Asteroid 4 book that is going to appear very soon. Uh, I think these chapters are both on Astro PH. Mine is not, well, uh, the one I'm the first author is not there yet, I'll put it because otherwise Mio will kill me. <laughs> and uh, so there are three main, three chapters dealing directly with uh, thermal and thermophysical modeling. And the, the co-authors and authors of these chapters are basically in this book. But there are many, yeah, there are many other chapters that are related to thermal, thermal and thermophysical models, but they're not directly uh, based on thermophysical modeling or thermal modeling. Yeah, this, the David V. Yarkovsky in New York. There are many. So, for example, 
the origin of S-type asteroid. This is not exactly what we call a thermal, thermal physical model, but it's basically, uh, it's basically what we call thermal evolution model. It's uh, where you calculate temperature inside of an asteroid that is born is about, so it is, 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 is a new asteroid is forming in the early solar system and is heated, for example, by radiogenic uh, elements such as the aluminum 20 sticks. And this is important for the thermal metamorphism. I try to go quickly here with this. No, sorry, this is dangerous. dangerous. Hey, let's, let's, okay. I try to go. I try to go quickly. Here. Sure. So, for example, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh -oh. No, it's okay. Okay, so there are many, many chapters, and for example, this is. Uh, yeah, so yeah. the aqueous activity, because this deals with, uh, so the uh, aqueous alteration of uh, chondrite parent bodies in the early solar system is also related to temperature. And of course, uh, I highly recommend this chapter by David Jewett, that is the active asteroid. It includes objects that have sublimating volatiles in the outer solar system, in the in, well, sorry, in the main belt, but also uh, objects like Phaeton that has a different process for uh, activity. Yeah, and of course, the long-term evolution of an impact monitoring of asteroids is important because of the Yarkovsky effect. And also this chapter by Belskaya and Alberto is not related, not directly thermal modeling, but asteroid polarimetry is a different way to get uh, albedos that can be compared to the radiometric albedos that we derive by knowing the magnitude, the visual magnitude of an asteroid and its, uh, and its uh, size that we get from radiometry. And so it's part of the, of the uh, interest. And uh, Alberto will talk about this, uh, I suppose, later, this, today. So very briefly, simple thermal models. Uh, this is things are known, but just I review very quickly. So here is the SCD uh, in the visible near IR and thermal IR of an asteroid that have two asteroids that have the same brightness in the visible. But they are very different. So one asteroid has an albedo of 0.1, the other 0.4. The brighter asteroid is half the, uh, is, is, uh, half the size of the, uh, of the dark one. And you see that in the, in the visible, they have the same brightness. So you cannot distinguish by an optical telescope. But if you go to the thermal IR, you see that the flux is different. And so if you measure the, the flux here, you can distinguish them. And this is uh, Emery uh, et al measurements of Bennu that looks very much like my uh, plot, so, but this, this is real. And so this is a uh, Spitzer IRS uh, measurement of uh, Bennu to constrain its size and the thermal properties. Um, so the, the, everything, uh, I would say, it was already there in the 70s. Uh, and this is a beautiful paper. It's a nature paper by Ellen that uh, used the radiometry to get the diameter of Vesta with the 30-inch uh, telescope. I think it was a private telescope. I'm not sure, sure about it, but sponsored by NASA. And basically, uh, you can uh, write the equation we, we saw before. So this is the diameter of the asteroid, and this is the Planck function. This is the temperature of the subsolar uh, point that we got from the previous equation. And this f is a function that um, taking into account that the object is spherical. So you have some facets that are not at the same temperature of the subsolar, temperature, subsolar point. And then there are some other corrections due to the non-illuminating, the, the fact that you see the asteroid not at zero phase angle. So this is the illuminated fraction of the asteroid. And then you can relate the temperature to the albedo of the asteroid, and you get the size from this equation. Because this you equate it equal to the measure value. But it's interesting, this paper, because you see already that uh, they knew what the problems were in calculating temperature. So if you read here, it's hard for me from far back, but you see that uh, uh, so there are, he, uh, Alan discussed problems related to the no sphericity of the body, to the fact that the body is rough, and so it's not a lambertian surface. Therefore, its temperature 
it could be higher when you observe it from zero degrees of Feng's angle. So the apparent temperature is higher than that of an inversion surface. And then he says that rotation plays also an important role. And we'll see this in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, it's, it's a very, very cool paper. And he also here is very interesting because they say, okay, this approximation holds for uh, asteroids with regolith, but we suspect that the small asteroids don't have regolith. They say small asteroids will retain no dust. And so back then, uh, the, we're thinking that the small asteroids haven't had no regolith, no dust. Here are the measurements. And he got a diameter of uh, 573, very different from the diameter that was obtained before from uh, different techniques, and, but very, very, very good uh, agreement with the uh, uh, spacecraft measurement. So it worked. Later on, the basic equation was slightly modified by Lebowski et al. to include a correction <laughs> for this effect due to surface roughness that is beaming, let's say like this, the flux towards the observer, towards the sun. Uh, and if the observer is close to the sun, angular distance, then you see an enhance in the temperature. And so you correct the, the subsolar temperature by this eta parameter that was uh, uh, calibrated on large asteroids for which the diameter was known from uh, occultation. And this, so if you make it smaller than one, you get a temperature, you get this increase in temperature. Uh, and so this is the idea. So the surface roughness increased the apparent temperature of surfaces at small phase angles. So eta smaller than one. But somebody thought, uh, okay, we can also use it the other way around. So you, if you observe an asteroid that has uh, a non-regolithic surface but has a substantial thermal inertia, thermal conductivity, then you need an eta smaller than one, uh, larger than one. And here I give you an example with a standard thermal model. This is the standard thermal model. And here an example of, a, of an object that rotates fast around these, this z-axis, and so the temperature is distributed all uh, around uh, the longitude. So the temperature is, uh, only depends on the latitude. And the, I apologize for the scale, uh, the color palette that is pretty poor, but, but, but the higher temperature is 405K, and the lower temperature, and it goes from yellow to blue, and you see that uh, if you have substantial thermal inertia, uh, then the object is, has a uh, overall lower temperature of a uh, standard thermal model. This is basically the concept of the NITEM that uh, was invented by uh, uh, my uh, former PhD supervisor, Alan Harris, and the supervisor of others here in the room, uh, that uh, he came with this idea of using eta as a fitting parameter. So you basically you adjust eta to the measurements. And it, in a certain way, it also tells you something about object because if eta is low, uh, is more than one, you probably have a dusty surface. But if eta is substantially higher than one, then you have substantial thermal inertia, which probably means back then uh, not much regulate or blockier regulate. Uh, this is an example from a paper that uh, we published in 2003. So this is the SCD of the measurements at Keck uh, spectral uh, uh, photometry in the thermal IR. And these are the curve of standard thermal model of a fast rotating thermal model, which is a very high eta. And the one with the eta adjusted, the beam parameter adjusted to the data. So the near Earth, uh, Earth asteroid was born for near Earth near the near earth object but in the last uh, 10 years has been used for everything and here is a beautiful picture of uh, the inclination versus the same major axis of uh, uh, asteroids in the main belt uh, color coded according to their albedo derived by knowing their magnitude from the minor planet center and the sizes determined by using the NITAM from the wise spacecraft and this is the preliminary release of diameters and albedo from Masiero et al. 2011. And you beautifully see the family. Here are the flora family, which not everybody agreed is a family. Vesta, the dark uh, uh, Polana, New Polana, Eulalia, and others. And here is Themis, and so on. Eos, and so on. 
I think another very interesting work was uh, this work done by uh, uh, Andy Rifkin that, um, that uh, basically uh, used the specs at the RTF and he took a spectrum of a dark object and he noticed that when you go to the near IR, you see a deviation from a pure reflected, uh, reflected light. This is what he called the thermal tail, if I'm not mistaken. And people have been using this work. This was the basic for to do a near uh, IR radiometer, so get albedos and diameters of asteroids using uh, information in the IR. And I think this is the basic of the work that has been done with the worm spitter and uh, the worm wise and so on. Uh, here just have a plot. Um, the, uh, these are the same plot I did before, but just for NEAs. These are all NEAs. The dark dots are the known NEAs a few years ago. And this is just, um, I think, 80% uh, of the sample of the objects for which we uh, uh, got uh, uh, albedos and diameters using the uh, worm speeder survey by Dave Trilling et al. And uh, Migo Muller will talk about this because he was the main uh, person behind the thermal modeling of this work. Now, I go quickly to the, uh, to the T diffusion and the thermophysical modeling. So basically, when you illuminate the surface of an asteroid, the surface element, the heat is diffused in the subsurface by, due, by this equation. That for temperature independent parameters, you get uh, this uh, simplification. Now, there are ways to define uh, these parameters that I mentioned already, the thermal inertia, that is gamma, the square root of conductivity, uh, density, and heat capacity. Z here is the uh, coordinate, the depth, uh, along one surface element of an asteroid. T is temperature, and small t is time. So to go very, very quickly, basically, 10 minutes. Oh, uh, basically, uh, if you have low thermal inertia, we saw that this is the temperature curve that you get. But this is the midnight, uh, midday, and uh, uh, again, midnight for an asteroid rotating six hours. If you increase thermal inertia, you get smoother curves. And here's the value of the thermal inertia in SI unit. So by comparing uh, the, coming back to the, the eta values from the NITAM was were used to infer thermal inertia of asteroids. So these are uh, NITAM eta values as function of the solar angle. These are the measurements. And we, here we say, okay, let's assume that uh, the, the, the thermal inertia of the NEA population, these are NEAs, uh, is, uh, is rather constant. So, and, and here, in, instead of uh, basically looking at different objects, you can imagine you're looking at the same object from different geometries. If the, the, the asteroid had the same properties. In reality, we were watching each point is a different asteroid. And then you can, you can use a thermophysical model to calculate, uh, to, to calculate fluxes and then invert the fluxes using the NITAM to calculate the eta. And this is the distribution. The green is the distribution of etas you would get for a thermal inertia of only five. If you increase the thermal inertia to 200, you get the, 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 this region here uh, covered by red uh, dots, the red uh, simulation are here, which pretty much would pretty would match pretty good with the observation. But if the thermal inertia is even higher, you would expect the distribution of etas in this uh, blue range. And so by doing this exercise, we kind of constrain the average thermal inertia of any age. Emmanuel Lelouch did the same uh, thing for um, uh, uh, objects in the outer solar system. But instead of using the, 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 the phase angle, because he didn't have it, uh, it's very small, the, the, he used the heliocentric distance, which is very brilliant, I think. And he could constrain uh, the thermal inertia of this object to be very low, to 2.5 SI units. Uh, Alan Harris and uh, Linie Drube also used the eta to find the metal-rich uh, asteroids. Here you see the eta as function of the infrared albedos for um, different classes of objects. So the C types are here with the, gre the green dots. The uh, S types are here with this uh, uh, kind of orange uh, sp spot here. And the M types 
which we don't really know what they are. The not M types does not necessarily mean metallic. Uh, are here in this region. And as you see, uh, you see an enhance in the eta values here. So eta, higher eta means generally higher thermal inertia. And so because of the thermal inertia is, of metal is high, um, Aris and Drube interpreted this as an evidence that some of these objects have high metal content. They also combine this plot with uh, the radar albedo. And you see that the, the object with the high eta some of them, they also have high uh, radar albedo, which is also consistent with the met high metal content of their regular. I think I have to speed up. So uh, here is an example of a thermal physical model where we don't deal with sphere, but we get the shape model, in this case from a radar, and we calculate temperature for each uh, facet. Um, each facet is also needs to have a, 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 a a surface uh, microscopic roughness attached to it. There are different models of, su of surface roughness. The most used one, but it's not the only one, is to add uh, craters to the surface elements. Uh, these craters are not real craters, but they basically is a mean to, um, uh, to calculate the emission and the temperature of a surface that is not flat, but has a substantial uh, uh, roughness. Um, I think I'll skip uh, very quickly this uh, equation and uh, also this. Um, but let me say, basically, the boundary condition of the model, so the, this is the heat diffusion equation. The boundary condition is the emission from the surface, uh, the uh, conduction in the subsurface. This is the uh, illumination from the sun with the shadowing component. And this is the... Ref uh, the light reflected from all other surface, it surface uh, hitting the surface from which we can want to calculate temperature. And this is the same thing, but in the thermal IR. So this is the, what's called the heating, the mutual heating of the surface element due to other surrounding, uh, to, due to landscape uh, surface around it. We, in the case of Comet, you have to include uh, the ice sublimation the, uh, the latent heat of ice is another volatile species, uh, and you need a gas diffusion equation. So I'll skip this. And uh, typically, a TPM does uh, the, the following thing is done. This is from uh, Berzitis' uh, work. You basically calculate a model, uh, temp model fluxes uh, to compare with observed fluxes as a function of different parameters the size, the thermal inertia. Uh, the rotational angle and the degree of roughness of the body. And you compare by chi-square metric, for example, to the observed uh, values. And you see here from uh, 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 Joseph Hanush paper, you see how the chi-square uh, is a strong function, in this case, of uh, thermal inertia. So you can, we can constrain the thermal inertia. Uh, I think I'll uh, go quickly here. In principle, the, we know that the temperature, uh, the thermal inertia and thermal conductivity are also temperature dependent. And here you see an example of the, of the dependence of temperature. Uh, this, is, um, this is basically the, con the thermal conductivity of, the, of, a regolith, uh, uh, of a regolith. You have the conductivity of the bulk, so the, the grain of the regolith, and this is the conductivity of the, in the, uh, of the pores of the regolith. And, um, you see that the, the, the difference in temperature between a model that has a, temp a constant, a, uh, uh, a temp um, sorry, a conductivity that does not depend on temperature, and a conductivity that does depend on temperature. You have a, an effect, especially in the night side. And this is well known from the moon, from the, from the moon studies. We'll probably hear more uh, by Paul uh, soon. Um, the, the KB is also temperature dependent because this we know from m m laboratory studies that, um, that uh, the, uh, the thermal conductivity of uh, meteorite samples is uh, temperature dependent and depends also on the, on the thank you, on the um, material. This is the studies of a pay. And by using uh, the this information about KB. So notice uh, how the conductivity shoots down uh, when you go to uh, where the cold Bacchevel CM 
meteorites, which is, has a very low uh, thermal conductivity compared to H meteorites, L meteorites, and the, this N-satite uh, B meteorite. But this is an information that you get for the KB, the thermal conductivity of the, of the bulk. And by using this information, uh, I like this work of Gundlach and Bloom that I don't have time to describe, but basically they can, from, from a measure by comparing, uh, they have a model that takes into account these parameters I described, and they compare the model with uh, thermal inertia derived from astronomical observation, and they get information about the grain size. I'm sorry, I, I have to go quickly here. In this case, this is Eros, but we'll hear more probably. So this is Eros, and it got uh, a grain size of about a few millimeters. That is perfectly matched with the observation. So, for example, we know that Itokawa has a high thermal inertia, is very, uh, has a very coarse regolith. And as we go down in thermal inertia, we see with, from observation, finer and finer regolith. Um, there's also a correlation between thermal inertia and size of asteroids that has been updated, is less clear. This uh, now, there's still something, but uh, there are objects with very low thermal uh, uh, inertia here that uh, they were explained with a very, very fluffy surface. So very, very, very low thermal inertia means a super high porosity of the regolith. And Vernazza et al. explained this uh, surface that is made like a fairy, fairy tale castle structure where you have uh, grains of regolith almost suspended in void. Uh, in this last minute, two minutes, I describe a few uh, cool things I like a lot. So to me, it's fantastic that uh, by measuring uh, uh, thermal properties and the Yarkovsky effect, which is a combination of physics and physical information of the asteroid and dynamics, you can weight the asteroid. And there are some examples, but it's not easy. You can see here, for example, that uh, the variation of the same major axis of the or orbital, same major axis of an asteroid is a function of, I'm sorry, this is not the best equation you could probably find, but it's just to give you an example. This is a direct function of the diameter and the, uh, the <clears throat> density of an asteroid. So if you measure the diameter and you know all the parameters, the albedo and the thermal parameters and so on, you can get the density. And this is done by many, uh, not many, but some uh, authors, but in particular, the, this was a highlight by Ben Rositis and uh, Eric and uh, Josh. They uh, found a very, very low density and very low thermal inertia for 9050 EDA. And they can, since this object spins very fast, uh, they concluded they should, should f uh, fall apart, it should uh, break up. But it doesn't because probably there are uh, uh, cohesive forces keeping it together as predicted by many of my uh, studies of Dan Shears and so on. Um, this is also cool. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, what we can do today. And this is a VR measurement of, uh, from Dawn of Vesta. So it's a temperature map by the group in Rome, uh, from Federico Tosi and so on. And by using these maps, um, Maria Teresa Capria that could not come, she wanted to come, she basically can, uh, could wrap a, a basic thermal inertia map here on uh, the Vesta. I don't go to need it. And finally, and I want to show this. This is, this is beautiful, I think. It's related to the moon. And um, so basically, we, 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 uh, in my, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, presentation, uh, you can get that uh, high thermal inertia means, uh, so low thermal inertia means uh, Fine regolith, higher thermal inertia means coarser regolith. And so the thermal inertia is a certain way measure the rockiness of the surface. And on the moon, this is a fantastic, in my opinion, because uh, you, you see here, this is the, the palette here is basically the rockiness of a surface. And you see the young craters have, have, are rockier, so they have higher thermal inertia here than uh, older crater. As you go to higher, low, uh, older crater, you see less rocks. So the rocks get covered by regolith as the regolith builds up with time. And I wish that we will one day do the same for asteroids. So here you see beautifully 
basically this is the uh, I, I'm, I'm done this is the age of craters and this is basically the rockiness and you see how beautifully they correlate this is work by Paul and Rebecca Gant so Gant is the first thought I think I can conclude with that thank you I think we ca we can we have time for one or two questions. Alberto. Can you specify a little better what is the role of rotation? Because I mean, a rapid rotation mimics in some way a, a, a higher thermal inertia and the opposite if it is low rotator. Uh, how did all these uh, results can be influenced? Okay. And to what yes. extent? Yes. So if my Mac allow me, there is a slide about that. It's here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's bad behaving Mac. So it's basically these curves here that is the diurnal temperature of an asteroid 1.1 AU. I think Migo did, did this plot. <laughs> I'm blaming you for that. If there's a mistake, no. Um, it, these curves are, are, are a function of thermal inertia, but really they are a function of this parameter, the thermal parameter which is a product of thermal inertia gamma times the square root of the rotation uh, uh, frequency, rotation rate, omega is 2 pi divided by the frequency and the temperature. So basically an object that has a low thermal inertia but rotates super fast has the same temperature distribution of an object with higher thermal inertia but rotates slower. And this is captured by this equation. Also, in the outer solar system, because you have a very strong component of temperature. So if, if the object is very far away from the sun, its temperature is very smooth because uh, of this uh, t to the third at the, the denominator. So an object close to the sun responds quickly to the, illuminate, to the variation of illumination. Last question. Marco, I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand all the different effects that are folded into the beaming parameter. This is something in, in lunar studies we don't worry about because we have resolved thermal maps of the surface, but it seems to me that in addition to thermal inertia, you've also got the, the surface roughness on all scales in addition to the shape, and um, you've also got variations in thermal inertia spatially on the surface, for example, like you showed the blocky ejecta around fresh impact craters. So you've got a, a um, phase dependent, you've got a, a thermal emission phase function that depends on surface roughness and thermal inertia variations, and you've got an albedo uh, phase function as well. Are they, those things accounted <clears throat> for in, in these models? Um, I think the right person to ask this question is Ben, but I can uh, say something. So, um, yes, correct. So the, the, the beaming parameter is, as it's formulated for simple models, simple thermal models, is, uh, is, it, it, it includes uh, all these possible effects. Because even it, it, it how to say, um, um, even the shape, the global, the, the gross shape of the object is included in the, in the beaming, basically. Because if you have uh, a d difference compared to the sphere, you start to see it in the beaming. By it's, and, and so the beaming parameter is not a uh, unique function uh, of the object. It's not a property of the object. But it depends, for example, on the geometry of observation. I don't know, Ben, if you want to add something. Hello. Yeah, so you pretty much described it quite well already, but I would add that at present for asteroids, we basically assume like an average roughness across the entire surface. But in reality, it could be, yeah, it could be spatial variations. But for, you know, for, yeah, disintegrated observations of asteroids, we just assume an average roughness. But I mean, from like, from spacecraft observations of asteroids, like um, Rosetta Letitia, we do see like a, a limb enhancement effect of the roughness, so like temperatures near the limb appear brighter than they should be. So, yeah, so it definitely plays a part. 
Um, I think there have been some investigations now, but I think it's the um, the roughness dominates over that optical effect. So, at the present, maybe at the shorter wavelengths, uh, that may be more important. So. I would like to add that we don't have beaming parameter in the thermophysical model. So the beaming parameter is, well, we, we can, but we try to avoid it. So the beaming parameter is uh, like, um, is at least we use it for simple models. And honestly, the aim of simple models is basically to, de to derive sizes and then albedos for objects that you have no information about. You don't know this, the, the shape, you don't know the spin state. However, you want to derive a diameter. And it turns out that the, the, by using a beaming parameter that you fit to the data is so far the best method we have, which is the, the NITAM. And it works. So the, 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 the uncertainty of this, let's say, the model uncertainty of the NITAM in size is about 15, 20% uh, relative. So it's not bad. Okay, we have to move. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sui. But this is the last name. Sorry. I always had these confusions. So. Uh, Dr. Fumihiko, uh, and the, the, he will talk about infrared laser survey with Akari. I will tell you when uh, it's 20 minutes. 10 minutes more. We'll try to, to have a, a discussion. So. <laughs> I, I, try. I try. So, good morning. So, uh, maybe. For, for most of you, this is the first time to see you. This is Lucy. Nice to see you. So I'm, I was working at JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, about 10 years for satellite operation. And I, I, I am University of Tokyo, Japan. And uh, so I would like to thank the organizer to give me an opportunity to give uh, a review of our project at this conference. And uh, but the uh, it was too long trip to arrive here. It was about 20 hours <laughs> got to do, uh, no, 24 hours got to do. So I should enjoy to stay here. <laughs> okay, so this is our satellite, Akari. Thank you for coming. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> so this is Akari, infrared astronomical satellite. And this is our satellite. And the word of Akari is, uh, means the uh, light or warm light in Japanese. So I'd like to introduce our project uh, observed with this satellite. So uh, I would like to talk about the two topics about the observation with Akari. First one is a mid infrared asteroid survey with Akari to construct size and albedo catalog. And the next one is a near infrared spectroscopic survey for studying the exploring Hydrated minerals on surface of asteroids. So the rest is the first one, mid infrared asteroid survey with Akari. So this is a topic of the measuring size of asteroids. So there are many techniques to uh, measure size of asteroids, and here we concentrate on radiomet radiometric measurement with thermal infrared observations. And uh, uh, large amount of data being collected by infrared space telescopes, especially space uh, infrared surveyors, because uh, if we can use surveyors, we can make some uh, a lot of, of uh, objects can be observed in short period of time, and we can uh, make uniform data set. So we are using Akari. Akari is the ja uh, first Japanese infrared satellite for infrared astronomy. The s dimension is about 2 meter and 3.7 meter with uh, about 5.5 meter solar paddle. And uh, so in the cryostat here, uh, a telescope with about uh, 70 
centimeter diameter uh, are mounted on the, uh, in the cryostat. And this satellite was uh, launched to 2000, uh, February 2006, and the uh, operation was already terminated on, in November 2011. So the backside of the mirror, there are two focal plane instruments. One is an infrared camera, IRC, and uh, the other one is a far infrared surveyor, FIS, like this. And uh, we are using IRC for asteroid study. And IRC consists of three channels, NIR, MIRS, and MIRL. And the wavelength coverage is from two microns to 26 microns. So the for all sky survey, we used only two channels, MIRS and MIRL. So the prime purpose of uh, Akari is making a uh, all sky survey. So the observation was started in uh, May 2006 and uh, uh, from 2006 and ended about August 2007, about 16 months. And the orbit is a sun synchronous polar orbit of altitude of 700 kilometer, almost same as Ida, so wise. And the uh, orbital period is about 100 minutes, so scan speed is about 3.6 arc minutes per second. And the uh, observing direction is uh, perpendicular to the solar direction. So this means the solar elongation angle is about 90 degree. And the observation was done with IRC and FIS. Wavelength cover is uh, 9 micron, 18 micron with IRC, and uh, from 65 micron to 160 micron with uh, uh, FIS. So this is a distribution of detected point source in, uh, with uh, Akari observations. So the point sources are extracted by uh, automatically pipeline processing from the mid infrared part of the all sky survey image data. So the number of uh, point sources is about 4 million in 9 micron band, uh, 9 micron and uh, 1 million in 18 micron. And from this uh, point source, uh, list of point sources, uh, the source is detected twice or, more, uh, twice or more at the same position of the sky are uh, cataloged in the point source catalog. Point source catalog consists of stars and galaxies. So this is about the center of the galaxy, and this pattern is just the Milky Way. So, uh, uh, subtract this uh, contributed uh, source from the total one, the residual is like this. So, this residual consists of extended sources like this. This is uh, uh, some uh, galactic component of the extended sources, and signals due to cosmic ray heating, and uh, geostationary, sta uh, geostationary satellite and space debris around the Earth orbit, and also our solar system objects. So from this, uh, asteroids are identified with the detected point sources based on the predicted position of the asteroid with known uh, orbital elements. It is too, too faint, <laughs> but uh, uh, the number of total objects is about 5,000, 5,000. So, the, so from these uh, detected point sources, we performed some model calculation. I will skip this one, but uh, just mention we use just a standard thermal model, but the uh, beaming parameter is modified. We employed about five, hmm? 50, uh, 50 asteroids to derive the best uh, matched values for beaming parameter. So we modified these values for each uh, observing band. And this is a movie of the, of our uh, asteroid survey. The center is the sun, and uh, this is the Earth orbit, Mars and Jupiter orbit. So, okay. So the asteroids are plotted with a dot of the measured size and albedo, and the uh, Observing direction of Akari is a solar elongation of 19 degrees, so the observing is this direction.
Okay, like this. So the Akari observation, Akari all sky survey was continued 16 months. So the inner edge of the main belt region can completely covered with Akari observations like this. Okay, so from this data, we uh, constructed 5,000 asteroid catalog. Okay, so uh, this we named this catalog asteroid catalog using Akari or Aqua. And uh, so this is unbiased asteroid survey mid infrared wavelengths. There are number of asteroids are about 5,000 in nine micron band and 18 micron band. And the catalog data is already open to the public at this website. And we have a plan to release the flux data of individual asteroids uh, in near future. So you can uh, investigate with much more further uh, details, summer modeling or something for individual uh, objects with this uh, flux data. But uh, as you know, uh, there are three all sky, uh, infrared all sky surveyors observed the uh, asteroids, the pioneer in uh, ILAS and uh, our Akari and uh, WISE. WISE has much higher sensitivity, so I will show you. So this is a wavelength against the flux density of the um, model spectra of asteroids. The, this one is just a uh, asteroid located in, in a uh, Inner main belt region and outer main belt region, and some object beyond the Neptune object. And the detector sensitivity of IRAS is located around here, and the Akari is around here, but the WISE is much higher sensitivity like this. But uh, uh, the other factor of the whole sky survey is the uh, duration of observations. So IRAS observed about nine months, and Akari observed 16 months. Uh, thanks to the combination of liquid helium and cryocoolers, and WISE observed about uh, 10 months uh, in full cryogenic survey. But their mission was, is uh, extended as NEOWISE. So they, uh, they make all sky survey in mid, uh, near infrared turbines. So uh, corresponding with their data, uh, asteroid catalog is released ILAS, Akari, and WISE. So the number of uh, asteroids detected with these three is like this. ILAS about 2,000, Akari about 5,000, and WISE about, how to say, 130,000 or something. So the number is, the WISE um, has a much um, large number of objects. So let's make a comparison with the Akari and WISE measurements. So this is a, a comparison of the um, measured diameter and albedo of Akari and WISE, Akari and WISE. So the results are well, but some uh, outliers, for example, like this. So uh, from other uh, works, these objects, uh, for these objects, Akari me uh, wise measurements seem to be better than Akari, but most objects are agree. So, this is a distribution of absolute magnitude of asteroids detected uh, with these three. So, this is ILAS and Akari. So, please note that the Akari observation is almost complete. Uh, about uh, its uh, absolute magnitude of nine magnitude or larger object because of the, its uh, 16 months observations. And why is observed like this? So combining with these three, each magnitude of 11 or larger object are co completely covered. It, it corresponds to 20 kilometer or larger object in the ambient regions. So this is the size distribution of asteroid against the same major axis, ILAS, Akari, and WISE, like this. So, so the Akari 
Uh, the, the complete survey for larger asteroids, namely about、um, a few 10 kilometers, 50 kilometers, or 60 kilometers or, or larger in May Belt region. And WISE has significantly improved the number of smaller asteroids down to a few kilometers or 10, 1 kilometer. Okay, so this is a summary of asteroid catalog. So here I just、um, show you about the result of IDAS, Akari, and WISE. But、uh, also, as a space telescope, I mean, SX, ISO, Spitz, and Herschel. So, these data set complement one another and provide a comprehensive catalog for characterizing physical property of the asteroids. So, our、uh, chapter of Asteroid 4 is、uh, now accepted. Actually, last week or so. So, our work is <laughs> too slow, but、uh, finally accepted. So,、uh, Ami、uh, su submit our manuscript to the Astro PH so you can、uh, refer our works. So, this is a near infrared asteroid survey. So, the next one is near infrared spectroscopic survey with a c a r i So, this is a study for、uh, exploring water in the solar system. So, there are many reports of the existence of water. Or Asteroids like this. And we are concentrated on hydrated minerals. Hydrated minerals contain some、uh, hydroxyl or H2O. And,、uh, and these minerals are stable above the sublimation temperature of the water ice. So this is an important indicator of the existence of the water. And we focus on the absorption feature in three micron band like this. And this is one of the、uh, outstanding works for this、uh, field, Hiroi et al. 1996. This is the、uh, wavelength from UV to near infrared and against the reflectance spectra. These three are、uh, uh, data of the asteroids observed with ground based telescopes. And the、uh, best match to meteorite spectra measured in laboratory is like this. But,、uh, And、uh, hydrated minerals have significant absorption feature around here, but the、uh, observations from、uh, ground based observations are strongly limited by atmospheric absorption here. So we use space telescope. So、uh, I mentioned the whole sky survey. Like this.、Uh, all sky survey observation is just a continuous、uh, scan mode,、uh, scan, uh, constant scan speed about 3.6 arc minutes per second. But a c a r i has、uh, another capability of observation that is a pointed observation. Like this. So in the pointed observation,、uh, Is just a targeted observing mode. So, in this mode,、uh, we can observe some、uh, given the sky in about 10 minutes, like this, for deep imaging and spectroscopy. So, this mode is occasionally, <sighs> <Okay. laughs>、uh, occasionally inserted in、uh, uh, all sky survey mode.、Mm, so, the Akari、uh, nominal attitude is.、Uh, All sky survey, but the, this pointed observations are inserted. So, Akari、uh, observations started in、uh, May 2006, and the、uh, liquid helium boiled off around August 2007. And after that, we use、uh, cryo cooler to cool down the detector,、uh, and、uh, we can use、uh, near infrared channel of observations in this warm mission, in warm mission phase. So, in、uh, cold mission phase, we performed all sky survey and some limited pointed observations. And in warm mission phase, we observed about、uh, 12,000 pointed observations, not only for all,、uh, astral, uh, solar system objects, but also some galaxies in cosmological distance or something. So, for asteroid study, we made asteroid catalog from all sky survey. And here, We made、uh, spectroscopic observation in this warm mission phase. 
So, uh, there are three uh, space telescopes uh, with uh, spectroscopic mode in magnified wavelength. Akari and uh, Spitzer has uh, spectroscopic mode, but uh, they have only five micron or longer wavelengths. And ISO has uh, also have uh, a spectroscopic mode from two micron or longer with uh, high resolution mode, but the sensitivity is different. So this is a sensitivity, and Akari has a uh, here, but uh, ISO, uh, the sensitivity of uh, ISO is like this. So the uh, SED of asteroid is like this. So uh, ISO can observe the, the largest Asteroids or Ceres or Paras or something, and our target is slightly smaller asteroid, 100 kilometer or a few tens kilometer. So uh, Akari provides uh, variable spectroscopic data because of its high sensitivity and unique wavelength coverage in 2.5 to 5 micro. So we observed 66 asteroids, and uh, most of them are observed twice or three times. So the total of the was done 147 times with the uh, infrared channel of IRC. And the wavelength coverage is 2.5 to 5 micron with uh, low resolution. And the target is the main belt asteroid to heal the object. And the uh, taxonomy is like this C type, S type, X type, and some D type, 1 V type. 1 V type means the best. And, Data reduction was done with the official toolkit uh, coded with IDL. And, uh, okay, so, so this is an example of data of uh, observ spectroscopic observations. For spectroscopic mode, we have one reference image, imaging frame, and seven or nine uh, spectroscopic frames. And Akari has uh, some unique mask like this. So lower side, uh, 10 arc minutes by 10 arc minutes imaging area and small aperture, one arc minute and one arc minute. So the uh, targets are guided into this small aperture to obtain uh, spectrum without uh, contamination of background sources. Okay, so this is a result of uh, spectrum from 2.5 to 5 microns. There are some significant features of absorption, but uh, there are some uh, contamination of thermal emission. So we subtract this component by using thermal model. Here we use NITAM. And after that, we uh, divided this spectra by a solar spectra to obtain reflectance spectra. Here, I just show you 2.5 to 3.5 micron. So here, clearly shows some uh, significant absorption feature associated with hydrate minerals, and maybe this one is uh, the absorption related to water or water ice or something. So this is uh, some example of the results of C-type asteroids. So most of C-type has clear absorption feature in 2.7 micron like this. And some, for example, this one has some water ice absorption, maybe this one. But this is just a preliminary result. So maybe you are uh, excited with this data. I am excited, but this is just a preliminary result. So this is also S-type. But all S type has almost a flat spectra, so no absorption feature in 2.7 or 2.8 micron band. There are some uh, small feature like this, like this, like this. But the, these must be uh, some artifact uh, due to some uh, hot pixel on detector or some contamination of background sources or something. So we need to uh, uh, examine these features in more details. So. This is preliminary research. <laughs> no, so we will publish about uh, 66 object spectra in the near future. So please wait for a while for detailed discussion about this uh, result. OK. Mm, okay. So this is uh, the summary of um, my talk. The first one is a mid infrared asteroid survey to construct size and albedo. And the second one is a near infrared spectroscopic survey. So that's all. Thank you very much. a lot.
uh, we have time for for questions, and that's the idea to have some questions here. So. In uh, in Newton, technically, the thing that is. Ah. <laughs> Hello, YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, in Newton, typically, uh, the, the beaming factor is fit from multi wavelength thermal data. So, why do you are you using a different value for ah, yeah, 9 yeah, yeah, micron yeah. and 18 yeah, micron? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Thank you. So that is a good point because uh, we. Of course, we don't know that. This one. So, yes, uh, we should uh, employ some new term to uh, derive size and albedo. We understand, but our uh, observation, uh, the number of our observations are detecting the asteroids in in general, very small, two times or three times. So, in uh, for example, a single band. So maybe this is not enough to employ some new term to derive some beaming parameter. We derive the, these uh, beaming parameter just uh, from some well-known asteroids to 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 to, to um, modify our. Uh, beaming parameter as a system parameter. So, so this one. We employed some 55 uh, well-known asteroids to derive our beaming parameter. Because uh, apparently, uh, a cadence of apparel observation is not much for uh, solar system study. Just uh, it makes uh, all sky survey. So we uh, employ some, uh, some technique to use STM. Is it answer your question? More questions? Here you go. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> uh, this is great work, obviously. Uh, and I especially love what you, the NIR spectra you just showed, because I think you guys are now the most sensitive instrument out there. Yeah. But this is just a common three question I wanted to ask is about the thermal. When you compare your results to Wise, mm. um, you get Wise. an excellent correlation for the diameters. So mm. the, the correlation coefficient is like 100%. So despite whatever you do with the eta factor, you seem to get the same results as them, which is reassuring. This one? But yeah, mm. then you get much, a much less good correlation for the albedos. Mm. And I really wonder how that can be, if there's something you do systematically different than, than them. But a, couldn't see what it is other than H magnitudes. Mm, maybe some object has some different H magnitude, but uh, oh, sorry, I, I am not uh, investigated in detail. It's just a funny discrepancy that I don't really understand. Mm. Okay. Yeah, questions? No, oh, I have one. I have one about the spectra. Yeah. The, uh, did you compare this uh, this with the already published one? This is not so unpublished. Uh, this is just uh, unpublished. Yes, yes but there are some published, uh, for, for example, ah, you mean the the, uh, of Palace and so on. Did you compare it with? with uh, uh, not yet, but uh, this is just ongoing. Very interesting. Mm. Very, very interesting on this. No, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so next speaker, Alberto. Alberto Cellino. And, 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 and I assume you didn't bring anything to protect yourself. I will. Please don't. I will tell you what. <laughs> he's he's going to talk about how to determine astral albedos, the role of polarimetry. So, of course, I, I feel a little like a mouse invited to the, in, a, in a meeting of cats. So, keep your clothes in and Wait for the hot breath. <laughs> so you should resist, I think. Why does it, this does not appear? It was before. Oh.
Okay, I will speak about asteroid albedos. First thing, since some Boris speaking speaker is to uh, give some definition because what's what 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 albedo? There are at least two definitions of albedo: geometric albedo and and bond albedo. Geometric albedo, as you know, is the ratio of the brightness of uh, of an object observed at zero phase angle, so in ideal sort of opposition to that of, um, of an idealized, idealized Lambertian, uh, Lambertian disk having the same cross section. And uh, uh, it is wavelength dependent. There is a pointer. Yes. Ah, sorry. Yes. Um, and the, the, the albedo takes the, its name from the Latin albus. This mean, that means uh, white. So this is basically the parameter that you use to describe the fact that an object has a dark or bright surface. Okay. And then there is the bond or spherical albedo, which is what is more relevant from the point of view of thermal radiometry, because this is the ratio between the the, this is the fraction of the incident uh, radiation that is uh, not absorbed and it is scattered in all directions at all wavelengths. So this means that what remains is the, is the radiation that is absorbed and determines, de determines the, the, the temperature of the body, the energy, the energy balance of the, of the body. The bond albedo is by definition defined uh, a third wavelength, but you can you can, uh, you can also uh, consider uh, uh, a reduction uh, at, si at single and discrete uh, uh, bands uh, or colors. Uh, these, these are things that have been published in 79 by, by, by Morrison Lebowski in the first asteroid book. And uh, there is a simple relation between the bond albedo and, uh, and the, the geometric albedo. It is the, this one that you see here where this QV, uh, the V sub suffix means that we are working in V light because this is historically the, 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 the wavelength band that has been used uh, in, in asteroid studies. Uh, the, the relation between the bond and the geometric albedo is, is given by this product where QV is this uh, integral of the, of the disk integrated brightness over all possible uh, values of phase angle. This is uh, named uh, phase, uh, uh, phase integral that has been first introduced 99 years ago by Russell. The problem is that uh, this is never known in practice. Uh, and, uh, and so it is not so trivial to, 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 to make this, uh, this conversion from geometric will be the vice versa. Uh, uh, and then there is this fundamental relation that uh, everybody knows that relates the size of an object. This is the equivalent diameter, uh, the, the, the diameter of an equivalent sphere having the same, the same, uh, the same volume. And this is the, this is the uh, uh, absolute magnitude measured uh, uh, in V light. Uh, and this is by definition measured at zero phase angle again, so uh, ideal sort of position. This is the geometric. But this is, but this is fundamental because if you have two of the three, of the three parameters, you, you derive the third one. So if you have, for instance, uh, some nice value of, uh, of size derived by thermal radiometry, by instance, if you know H, you can derive the, the geometric albedo. Or by the versa, if you have some value of the, of the geometric albedo, maybe from polarimetry, and you use H, you can derive the size. But there is a problem. The problem is H. The absolute magnitude of the asteroid is not a trivial thing to, to be measured because, because due to essentially two reasons. One is that it is if you if you make a, a a plot of the, of the, of the magnitude uh, as, a, oops, as a function of, uh, 
as a function of phase angle, there is a, a linear, nice linear trend that you like very much, but then at, at a small phase angle, there is a, a nonlinear increase that is essentially not uh, predictable. There is, there is not any clear dependence on uh, anything. So, uh, and this makes a difference because if you do not take into account this and you use a, a, a simple linear extrapolation of the linear part, uh, the, the results are going to change significantly. And then there is also another reason. The, the reason is that H per se is not, strictly speaking, a fixed parameter because it depends on the shape. At each uh, different apparition of an object, the cross section that is uh, accessible to the observers will be different and also H will change accordingly. So we have problems here. This, is, uh, this shows that uh, for what concerns the sizes, uh, we have good reasons to believe that uh, the sizes derived by thermal radiometry are very good. The, the, the answer, th this is a plot uh, of, uh, of the Kairi diameters against bias diameters, and you see that they are very nicely fitting. There is maybe some uh, some uncertainty that uh, depends on different uh, observing conditions, who knows, and so on. But the agreement is very good. But if you look at the albedos, the situation, as we were discussing before, is much worse. Why? But because uh, uh, the thermal radiometry uh, would require, in principle, that the, the, the thermal uh, flux measurements that you do are simultaneous some uh, measurements in V light, and this is never done in practice. So people have to, or nearly, well, there are, apart from the few cases in which we have the, 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 the thermophysical model, the detailed thermophysical models that Marco was mentioning before, in the vast majority of the cases, this is not the case. So you, the, the people uh, rely on some, some uh, estimate of H, they take them from the catalogs, and the catalogs are affected by huge errors, thanks to many agents. And then there is also the fact that you have many the uh, temperature models and so on that can also influence uh, the results. The, the, so the, this, is the, this is the reason why it is legitimate, my dear cats, to, to, to ask ourselves whether we can do something better using some other technique. And, uh, and this technique uh, can be polarimetry. Um, now I have uh, to probably to, 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 to spend some words about, to, to refresh your minds about polarimetry, what polarimetry is. And the, 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 the basic principle is simple. If you have a, a non-polarized incident light, uh, light uh, beam incident on some, on some surface, and then you have a, a scattering, uh, the, 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 the scattered uh, beam is, uh, tends to become uh, linearly scattered. The, the um, plane of, uh, of polarization, uh, linearly polarized, with the plane of polarization, which should be, uh, according to elementary Fresnel loads, perpendicular to the scattering plane. This means the, the, the plane that contains the sun, the observer, and the, and the object. What we do in practice is to, me to make measurements of, of, uh, of the linear polarization of, of asteroids at different uh, phase angles. And what we, 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 the phase angle is this angle, as you know, between the, 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 the direction to the observer and to the sun, as seen from the object. And what uh, uh, and the results of, of the observation indicate that the, 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 the the, the, the state of polarization, the, 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 the light from asteroids is always polarized, linearly polarized, but uh, it is uh, uh, polarized uh, uh, perpendicular to the scattering plane only uh, at phase angles larger than some limit that we call uh, the inversion angle. And there is a large uh, uh, interval of phase angles for which uh, the, 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 the light is polarized but in opposite. Uh, in the opposite direction. So this is something that is not expected, but uh, is, uh, I have no time to speak about this, but there are reasons, uh, physical arguments to explain this based on the phenomena of uh, coherent uh, backscattering and so on. And so you have uh, typically this kind of, of phase polarization curve. This is the, the parameter that we use. 
this is the, the okay, this is a, a degree of polarization because E perpendicular and E parallel to the scattering plane are E max and the mean of elementary physics. And, and we get this uh, kind of group, which are normally historically by some parameters. This is the alpha, the, the, the inversion angle. This is H, the slope. But you, see, you see here that there is a linear trend here, and, and H is the slope. And then there is also the extreme value of negative polarization, which is called P. Okay, let's go on. The, uh, all asteroids tend to, to have the same kind of, uh, of polarization morphology which can be described by the uni a unique mathematical relation. But of course, there are differences uh, uh, among the, the parameters that describe this, uh, this kind of, of trend. And these differences depend on the, on the taxonomic uh, classification and are a primary, a primary a, a consequence, as we will see in a moment, of difference of albedo, of geometric albedo. And this is a very, this has been known since, uh, well, since the 70s. These, these are the classical papers by Zellner and workers, in which this is a, 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 a slope uh, albedo uh, relation uh, in log log scale, uh, dating back to, to those years uh, and uh, using this kind of relation between geometric albedo and the, 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 the slope. And there was something also taking look at something of using p mean as, as the polarimetric parameter. And uh, this was used, was based on, the, on the laboratory experiments, which are not completely satisfactory because you never know what you are doing as long as you have to compare then with the, the, the behavior of real asteroids in their environment. Um, but in principle, polarimetry works. It is, it is a good technique to derive the, the geometric albedos. There are, of course, some problems uh, because you have to, 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 to sample the polarization course. Those, this is a lot of work. You have to, to observe them uh, many times. Uh, in the case, a particular case of near Earth objects, this is the, much easier because the Earth objects uh, run like mad and the phase angle changes quickly. So, the, from the point of view of servers, if you have a good uh, tracking of, and you are not losing the object, in a few days you can do the, 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 the you accomplish the task. And then, uh, of course, polarimetry uh, is a little demanding in, in terms of telescope size because we have to split the incoming beam into two different components. Uh, and, and so this is the reason for why for, for, uh, for well, after, for 20 years after the, the, the late 70s, there has been little done. But now the, the situation uh, starting from the 90s has started to, to improve substantially. So the general problem of calibration. Uh, this is the, 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 the relation between geometric albedo and, and, and slope. There have been different calibration and uh, different authors are using different coefficients. So it is urgent to converge to new and unique calibration. Also because if you look uh, at uh, some uh, data, for example, these are the, 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 the apophis uh, observations that we did uh, with Delbo and uh, Tedesco and some other in the in this uh, to, the 2006 published in 2007 and uh, you see that there is a fairly large uh, error in the in resulting value of, geom of the geometric albedo but this is not due to the observ to the observations error but are mainly as a consequence of the uncertainty of the of the calibration coefficients that they use when you convert slope into albedo so it is urgent to make something better, to, to make, do a new calibration. And to do this, we are, we are starting a, a campaign of observation using uh, as uh, our standard candles, our standard polarimetric candles, some, a number of, of, uh, of, of asteroids that belong to a, to, a, to a list that has been proposed by Cecek Tedesco in 2006. Uh, uh, these are objects for which we have very accurate uh, and more than independent uh, estimates of the size. These are uh, derived by, by star occultations observed by different uh, observers and so on. And uh, over, uh, even in situ by, by space probes. And also objects for which uh, we have uh, 
reasons to believe that also the absolute magnitude is uh, fairly decent. Huh? Uh, and this, and we are going, since now we are in 2015, we are going with, uh, with Maxime and Paolo to, um, to, to update this list, uh, which is now that takes 10 years. So. But uh, just limiting to the objects of Chateau Tedesco, at least some of them, because uh, not of them are, uh, have been served sufficiently so far, I can show you some, some, uh, some results. This is... Uh, this is uh, the, the relation between slope uh, and, and albedo hmm? uh, using the, 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 the data set that we have now at disposal. The green points are, ob are objects for which the sampling of the phase polarization curve is not uh, excellent. They have less than 10 observations. The others have at least 10. And this is the, the, the kind of linear fit that you can derive from them. The most discrepant object is two palas for which uh, we get uh, uh, an albedo of 0 0.14.5 in the Cercenco and Tedesco list, which looks a little strange for an object that is primitive, a B-type uh, as a taxonomic classification. Um, but uh, apart from Pallas, what is not uh, very convincing uh, in our opinion is that this uh, uh, best fit tends to um, uh, I saw very, very high albedos to objects that have very small polarimetric slopes. So this means, for instance, that if you look at an object like a 44 riser, which is an E-class object with a very shallow polarimetric slope, you can get easily some uh, albedos of the object of 0.8, something that starts to be poss possibly too, too high. And uh, there is also the fact, uh, yes, that uh, if you look uh, well at how the, the points are distributed here, it is tempting to, 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 to think this is an old subject. That may be, uh, you should not try to fit all the objects together, but trying to exclude the, 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 the lower beta ones, because if you, if you exclude them, you get this which is much, uh, the, the root mean squares of the feet are, are in, increases a lot. You have no longer the problem of overestimating the albedos of, of, of just like NISA. And, uh, and of course, you are, you are a priori excluding this, uh, this object from your analysis because uh, you think that uh, the, 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 the calibration is not good for them. So what to do in practice? Uh, one possibility is that you can make your polarimetric observations if uh, the, 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 the value or the slope that you get is something less than a given value, but excluding this, this zone, and you, and you can use this part, which is very, very accurate. If you have uh, an object which has uh, a, a steeper slope, you, you, you use the, the previous one, which is most possibly a little worse, but you do not, you're not going to make a, a terrible uh, mistakes. Uh, and uh, okay, this is shows that uh, using the uh, including from the analysis the, the, the albedo objects, you get uh, uncertainties in the albedo which are within 20 percent, which is good because if you look at the thermal radiometry data, uh, well, for single objects, in many cases, you can be 60 percent or even more. So, this is competitive, of course. This is just a curiosity. The referee of the paper was asking us to, 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 to look at some parabolic fit. We did, because we respect the referee. But, <laughs> but, uh, but we, we, we published the paper saying that we do not think that this is a clear advantage to use this kind of parabolic fit, because in any case, in region, you do not know what to do. Okay? Then there is the, the other historical possibility used to mean the, 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 the extreme value of negative polarization. What you get is this, which is, looks fairly bad. And here, the problem of the lower video object is much more evident. They are forcing these, these seeds to be steep. If you remove them from your analysis, you get something which is bad, much better. So our, our, well, so this is the, 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 the state of the art for PME. Then uh, you, we can also invent something else. Now we, we, can, we can fit uh, the, the, the phase polarization course uh, described by this, uh, 
and then we can use a new parameter like this C that we that we have uh, first uh, used in, in in our paper, which is nothing less than the difference between the, the polarization at 30 degrees and minus polarization 10 degrees, which is something that takes into account the overall morphology of the phase polarization curve. And what you get is this: it is a uh, very good root mean square, it's the best one, and uh, it has the advantage to be applicable to all object, all albedo objects. You uh, recently, uh, based on wise uh, albedos, uh, Joe Maziero et al. had also proposed this to use this parameter, which is also combination of uh, slope and p mean. And um, and we redo the the, 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 the the same computation using our data, and we we find we find something that is not bad, but um, but a little worse than the other plots that I showed so far. Um, these are uh, these are the, the 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 results of our uh, of our analysis, the values of the calibration. And the, the recipe that we give is this one, as I was already anticipating before. You, you, if you have a polymetric slope, uh, you use this, uh, uh, depending on its value, otherwise use this one. Do not use p-mean, but if it is less than 1%, you can use the, the one derived for a bright object. Use albedo from C for any object. And then, uh, uh, a couple of minutes, there is possibly some future for polarimetry. Now, the, the, the main problem of polarimetry is the fact that you have to, to observe many times, this is time consuming, boring, and so on. But uh, if you make a celebrated marriage between, uh, between uh, polarimetry and spectroscopy, you, you get, uh, you get uh, a nice, uh, a nice uh, child, which is the, 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 the gradient of polarimetry as a function of wavelength. And the preliminary uh, results show that, for, for instance, the, the, the low albedo objects tend to have uh, uh, this kind of, of, uh, of trend uh, in the negative branch of polarization, when you are in negative polar, uh, polar, polarization, and the, the opposite when you have positive polarization. If you have uh, the S type, which are medium intermediate albedo, you get something that is just the opposite. So, so this means that it is possible that in the future, just by having one single uh, spectropolarimetric uh, spectropolarimetry spectrum, uh, you, you, you can have already some indication of, the, of what is going on about the albedo of the object. And then we also you find some uh, interesting results uh, concerning, but I have no time, I have to run, yes, uh, concerning the fact that in some cases we, we find some violation of the generally general relation between, uh, between um, uh, uh, albedo and polarization. Normally, the so-called humo law says that uh, if an object is brighter, its polarization is, is smaller. And this is what uh, uh, is shown in majority of the cases in this plot. We have two lunar uh, regions. And then we have some objects, the, 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 the full lines are spectropolarimetry and the, the dashed lights are simple spectra, refractive spectra. And so you see, for instance, if you have a, a, dec a violent decrease of polarization, you have a, uh, that uh, the, the reflectance spectrum is increasing and this is general. But in, in the case of this object, for instance, the, the black one, they, they, they are, the, the spectropolarimetry and the, the reflectance polarimetry are going up together. So this is a violation of the humor law. So this is something that is interesting also for the people who are mad enough to, to study uh, light scattering, physical mechanics and so on. So what's the end? What can we learn from all these? I think that, uh, of course, this is uh, uh, this is obvious. Uh, to, in order to, to to optimize our chances to, to to achieve a good physical characterization of the of the aster or other other bodies, we have to use all the weapons that we have at our disposal. So even if some of them are so powerful, like thermal radiometry for sciences, it doesn't mean that we not do not. Uh, have to use also polarimetry for albedo and also and also spectra uh, spectroscopy spectropolarimetry so on and also the all the good photometry 
which is now written bad, bo badly, but it is. <laughs> uh, and so this is. Thank you. So on on one of your slides, you were taught you 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 made a comment that it was not possible to use laboratory measurements to calibrate the the curves. Could could you say a little more about that? Because it. On the there are, it seems like that would be the perfect way to do yes, it. Yes, this is the, the natural way. way. Uh, that the first thing that you think to bore naturally. The problems are already explained in the, in the, in the early uh, papers by Zellner and the work, actually using lunar finds and different. Uh, the problem is that uh, but there, there are several problems. One is, my, is, is small. And the, the fact that uh, it is difficult in the laboratory to observe at zero physics. And this is something that has some... And then there is the fact that to reproduce the, the results that you get when you observe a real asteroid in the sky by means of uh, using uh, laboratory samples, you have to crush them. And so, you know, there is some arbitrarity. How to crush... Uh, it is not so obvious uh, what is a, a clear theorem to, to, to tell you that you are crushing them right, to be a good, really good uh, um, uh, very good analogs of, of what is, are the real asteroids in their environment in the sky with their morphology and so on. So this is the re these are the main two reasons why we prefer to, to, to try something directly related to the, to the object in the sky. The, the, the problem that we have in this approach is that the video that we get from observation, even for these best observed objects, um, are derived by the relation between size, absolute magnitude, and albino. The size is good because we get them from star occultation. What can be a little wrong, again, is the uh, absolute magnitude. This is the reason why that there is a, we, we, we thoroughly need some, someone having the, 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 the time and the, and the will to, to make some kind of very big uh, uh, and systematic photometric uh, survey of asteroids. We, 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 if, you, if we look at the sample of atom object for which we have good phase magnitude and phase polarization uh, course, which are needed to do to, to this. These are in the, in the, the fingers to ends. So this is a major problem. We have one more, one more question here from Jürgen. It's just an add-on on, on that comment. I have unfortunately to say that there's a third caveat using laboratory data. And I will briefly talk about this on Friday in my talk. Um, we expect a, um, a porosity stratification of regolith due to the gravitational compression. Oh, yeah. And uh, measuring on Earth at 1G and comparing to an asteroid at 10 to minus 4Gs makes a huge difference. Yeah, and even yeah. if you could overcome the other more technical um, difficulties measuring at zero phase mm -hmm. angle and having the right size distribution, this is a fundamental problem I agree. that you'll never be able to solve. Yeah. And then there's also, this is minor, the problem of Earth contamination, because uh, you never know that you're sure that your meteorites are not contaminated. Because uh, we're, we're invading the yes. coffee break pose, but... Uh, sorry, everybody. Um, I have two questions, one short and entertaining and one nasty, but I'm trying to keep my class in. But let's start with the first one. <laughs> Um, since you trace back the word albedo all the way to Latin, uh, can I ask you a dumb question? Why do we use P of all letters to denote albedo? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, what is the list that yeah, I got? Albedo is denoted as P. Uh, and I keep, people keep asking me why and I have no answer. And I was hoping you would. Why the letter P for albedo? This is know? a good question. I don't know. Does anybody in the room? This is, this is in many, many papers, it was used, uh, this yeah, yeah. P. Uh, so, so, so Don't know. Yeah. But in the recent polarimetry book by Colo Colo et al, uh, we were uh, um, kindly invited to use A, something like that. But uh, yes, you're right. Okay. But this is historical you, tradition. I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, second question is then, 
So if I understand it correctly, it's really an empirical thing, right? You see slope correlates with albedo for all objects for which we have an independent measurement. So we assume that correlation holds for the objects where we don't, and we call that a measurement. This is the reason why we are interested to have uh, in our list objects that belong to different uh, taxonomic classes, uh, size classes, albedo classes, and everything. Otherwise, we are only exploring one small subsample of the population. Yeah, I was wondering, I, I kept hearing talks by, I think, Kari Muinonen, who wanted to come up with a model that would explain why we should expect this type of behavior. Can you comment on that at all? This is the, well, how to say, um, it is clear that in recent years there have been uh, significant advances in, uh, in, our, uh, in, in the capability of people like Harry Muinon and, and Shkuratov and other people who, who are interested in, in studying the, the, the physics of light scattering uh, mechanics. And uh, a major step, for instance, has been the, the, to, to recognize the importance of the co so-called coherent scattering mechanisms, which can explain probably at the same time uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the photometric opposition effect and also the negative polarization branch. And uh, Carly, uh, more recently, is making uh, very good uh, advances uh, in his studies, uh, in his numerical studies, considering uh, objects with, uh, constituted by Gaussian sphere, this kind of things. And uh, in general terms, when he looks, uh, when he shows us, uh, results of these, uh, these studies, uh, there is some reasonable agreement, uh, both in photometry and in polarity. Polar, polarimetry, polarization, but it is not yet uh, uh, completely satisfactory for all objects. For instance, there are the barbarians that are the subject of uh, Paolo Stoker later, which are, uh, which are characterized by a very anomalous uh, width of the negative polarization branch. And this seems to be something fairly difficult to explain by current uh, theoretical understand, understanding. Things are improving in any case. We are, it is clear that this holy graal of polarimetry has to have a disposal, some kind of analytical uh, theory, because we are, okay, we are aware that uh, empirical things are not so convincing for many people. But in general terms, it works, even at this stage. We're before the coffee break. We have very quick comment, I think, by Victor, and then we have coffee break. It's just uh, I need a clarification because uh, on your plots of uh, uh, albedo versus uh, slope, you kind of uh, your your fit systematically miss uh, Pallas. You said uh, that Pallas was a special kind of case, and I'm not the referee of your paper, so I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not suggesting to, to do the thing, but I think the palace albedo is quite solid. It also, uh, the, it's got a collisional family that has systematically like high albedo for, for uh, primitive objects. So I think that uh, that point is trustworthy in that sense, at least statistically. And also the fact that the family of palaces is, is made of small objects and whatever error is affecting palace's age value it's weird that it affects the small objects of its family in the same sense. I'm aware about the, the existence of the palace family. But what for concerns the um, palace itself, when we published this, uh, we also wrote that uh, this, uh, this kind of albedo for palace as is also confirmed by wise uh, measurements. But I received this morning a message from John Maziero telling me, oh, nice, uh, nice paper. But I have to tell you that it is not true that wise confirms this. And confirms this forcibly because the palace was taken as one of the calibration objects. And it was forced to, 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 to converge that, uh, to that value. So maybe. <laughs> There are not some paper by, by, by De Leon and other, and, or something that was showing that uh, there was, oh no, this was about the B types. No, okay, okay, yeah, this is nothing. <laughs> mm. It's not suspicious simply because it's the most discrepant one. 
Is this, this is the this is palace? If it is in a parabola, it's in a palace. This is it looks like it looks black like coffee. <laughs> so I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can. Uh, I, agree, think, I agree. No, thank you, thank you. I think we're. We need, I, I need personally need very much coffee, and it's uh, so we reconvene at eleven fifteen, right, uh, Javier? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. So thank you, everybody. Uh, so we, we have the coffee break outside. We have one floor up, and then go outside. Uh, 